Hello and welcome to The Farm. This week we're out of the studio and at the IBA M&A conference in Mumbai. And the one question we're asking all the guests here, is the daily economy about to recover in 2014? The fear of something being opened up one or the other regulator from a lack of clarity, particularly with retrospective impact. Principally by creating uncertainty around what the tax incidence will be in, in the case of Vodafone, particularly as a result of a sale, uh, that creates modeling problems for foreign investors when they try to figure out what they have to do with the business. Since India was revising its company law after 57 years, I had higher expectations. Uh, I would say I'm a little disappointed. I'm cautiously optimistic, but devil's in the details, so we'll have to see what the rules say. I think there is a settling down period. I'm just hoping that it happens as quickly as, uh, you know, as time passes. I think it's a promising futuristic le legislation. The spirit is the right one. The letter is very complicated and will have to be resolved over time. A huge uh, unlearning and learning experience, both. Well, in just a few minutes from now, I'll be joined by six top-notch M&A lawyers from across the world to talk about the future of M&A. And while I wait for them, let me catch you up with the top stories this week. Starting first with the SEBI order finding FTIL not fit and proper to own any shareholding or voting rights in a stock exchange or related entities in India. On March 19th, SEBI issued an order finding FTIL not fit and proper to acquire or hold any stake directly or indirectly in a stock exchange or clearing corporation and asked it to divest any stake held by FTIL in MCXSX, MCXSX Clearing Corporation, Delhi Stock Exchange, Vadodara Stock Exchange and National Stock Exchange within 90 days with an immediate freeze on voting rights. SEBI's order refers to Regulation 72C and Regulation 191 of the SECC regulations, both of which require a stock exchange's shareholders to be fit and proper. The order then refers to Regulation 21 that lays down fit and proper criteria and subsection B5 that lists grounds for disqualification, including any other order which has a bearing on the securities market and has been passed by any other regulatory authority. SEBI points to a December order by the Forward Markets Commission finding FTIL not fit and proper to hold 2% or more in any commodity futures exchange and reasons that a person who is not fit and proper to hold shares in a commodity futures exchange cannot be fit and proper to hold shares in a recognized stock exchange and clearing corporation. It seems likely that FTIL will now head to the Securities Appellate Tribunal. But is it likely to get any relief there? Well, joining me to talk about that is well-known counsel Tushad Cooper. Mr. Cooper, thank you very much for joining us on the farm. Let me start by asking you what you make of this SEBI order that finds FTIL not fit and proper to own any stake or voting rights in a stock exchange, given that the order is based entirely on the order of another regulator, namely FMC. My view on this is that SEBI would be entitled to rely on the order passed by the uh, FMC in uh, formulating its decision that uh, FTIL is not a fit and proper person. That is made clear by the provisions of Regulation 20 on which SEBI has itself relied on, particularly 21B5. The difficulty here is that that order of the FMC has not become final and is the subject matter of pending proceedings, writ proceedings before the Bombay High Court. Should the order be overturned, should the order be reversed, obviously any decision premised on that order would adversely affect uh, FTIL irretrievably. And the order passed by SEBI directing FTIL to divest itself of its shares would, be, would lead to a situation which was irreversible in the event of the High Court overturning the earlier order passed by the FMC. To that extent, FTIL would arguably have some grounds to urge and say that SEBI's order ought to have been kept in abeyance pending the outcome of the uh, appeal against the uh, order passed by the FMC. Now having said that, there is a second ground which perhaps might be urged by FTIL and that is its emphasis on the fact that under 21B5 
the finding must be that then order has been passed against the person concerned in this case FTIL which has a bearing on the securities market and the argument there will be that the FMC had passed this order in the context of the commodities exchange SEBI itself in its order has held in uh, I think one of its uh, paragraph 6 that the facts and law challenged in the writ petition are not the subject matter of the instant proceedings. If that be so, and SEBI itself feels that the facts in the proceedings before the FMC were different and are not, the, are not similar to the facts in the present proceedings, then in that event, could it have relied on the FMC finding in order to impeach FTIL's uh, status as a fit and proper person? So that could be another argument which would be perhaps open to FTIL and which it probably would urge strongly in its favor to seek some kind of a stay of this order. Mr. Cooper, what you seem to be indicating in the latter point that you made, which is the second one, uh, is that SEBI's order seems to be contradictory within itself, uh, that on the one hand it says that the FMC order against FTIL gives SEBI enough grounds to find FTIL not fit and proper under its own SEC regulations and on the other hand they're saying well the subject matter of what is going on in the Bombay High Court which is exactly connected to the FMC order is not what is connected to the SEBI order. Yeah, partly. I, I have taken that statement out of context perhaps just to show what could perhaps be arguably urged by FTIL because they do hold that in the instant proceedings the limited question is whether the view of the FMC dated 17th December 2013 FTIL attracts the disqualification. Now it does attract the disqualification under 21B5 because 21B5 contemplates that any order is passed which has a bearing on the security market by any regulatory authority then in that event such person could be held to be or would be held to be not a fit and proper person. What SEBI could have perhaps also relied on was the provisions of 21A, which it has indirectly done, which provides for a disqualification if uh, the person um, is, it shall be deemed to be a fit and proper person, if such person has a general reputation of record of fairness and integrity, not limited to financial integrity, good reputation and character and honesty. Now, clearly in this case, the charges which have been laid at the door of FTIL do impeach all these uh, criteria. And perhaps SEBI could have invoked these criteria under 21A. Given that the Bombay High Court has refused to stay the FMC order, uh, saying that considering the gravity of allegations which have been found to be established against the petitioners, this is not a fit case where prayer for stay can be granted in exercise of writ jurisdiction. How do you think the Securities Appellate Tribunal will look at any appeal made by FTIL asking for relief, a possible stay even, on SEBI's order? Uh, Manika, the distinction between the order passed by the FMC and the order passed by the SEBI are uh, materially different to this extent. That whereas the FMC has not directed any uh, divestment of holdings, the SEBI order has so directed. The result of the SEBI order would be an irretrievably prejudiced situation as against FTIL, whereas the order passed by the FMC doesn't result in such a situation. So the High Court refusing to stay the FMC's order would not result in a uh, situation of irretrievable prejudice which would ensue in the instant case should SAT not uh, issue any order of stay. The second argument would be that in any event the refusal to grant stay has not tantamounted to an affirmation that FTIL is in fact guilty of the various charges leveled against it. Now, the question I'd like to ask you, Mr. Cooper, is this, that if FTIL were to go to the Securities Appellate Tribunal and uh, explain to them exactly the case that you have made in our conversation, do you think the Securities Appellate Tribunal could recommend uh, that SEBI tone down its requirement of FTIL to dispose of its stake in the stock exchange and the other entities that SEBI has laid out in its order? Or could they ask for the stake to be put in some kind of escrow situation? Or could they ask for a free of the voting rights uh, that FTIL currently enjoys in all of these entities. What do you think would be uh, within SAT's purview to do, uh, given the argument that you're just making? Well, I think effectively 
what SAS would seek to do would be to uh, forestall the sale of these shares which has been directed by uh, SEBI. I don't think that there is any uh, other order which SAT could pass for the simple reason that if in fact the charges are made out and if in fact the FMC's order is upheld, then the order passed by SEBI ought to be enforced uh, fully and uh, ought to be given effect to fully, in which event the correct and proper order would be a sale of the shares. So to ra uh, request SEBI to tone down its order would perhaps not be uh, appropriate. If the findings against uh, FTIL, which have been made by um, the FMC, are in fact upheld by the High Court, or uh, the High Court refuses to intervene in its jurisdiction against that order, then according to me, SEBI's order would be absolutely correct. I All right, so what you're saying, Mr. Cooper, is that FTIL does have a slim chance of being able to win some relief in the Securities Appellate Tribunal against an immediate disposal of its stakes in MCXSX and some of the other entities as listed out by SEBI, that it could ask for some reprieve in terms of time till the case is decided, that is, the FMC case is decided in the Bombay High Court. I would think so, yes. Mr. Cooper, we appreciate you joining us uh, and sharing your thoughts with us on this matter. Thank you very much for that insight.